what are the measures of human intelligence and how do we measure it? Everybody has an idea of what they mean by intelligence. In the, in the vernacular, what I mean by intelligence is just being smart, how well you reason, how well you figure things out, what you do when you don't know what to do. Those are just kind of everyday common sense definitions of how people use the word intelligence. If you want to do research on intelligence, measuring something that you can study scientifically is a little trickier. And what almost all researchers who study intelligence use is the concept called the G factor, general intelligence. And that is what is common. That is a mental ability that is common to virtually all tests of mental abilities. What's the origin of, of the term G factor, by the way? It's such a funny word for such a fundamental human thing. The general factor, I really started with uh, Charles Spearman. Uh, and he noticed, this is like, uh, boy, more than 100 years ago, uh, he noticed that uh, when you tested people with different tests, all the tests were correlated positively. And so he, he was looking at student exams and things. And he invented the correlation coefficient, essentially. And he when he used it to look at student performance on various topics, he found they all the scores were correlated with each other and they were all positive correlations. So he inferred from this that there must be some common factor that was irrespective of the content of the test. And positive correlation means if you do well on, on the first test, you're likely to do well on the second test. And presumably that holds for tests across even disciplines, so not within subject, but across subjects. So that's where the general comes in, Some so, something about general intelligence. So when you were talking about measuring intelligence and, and trying to figure out something difficult about this world and how to solve the puzzles of this world, that means generally speaking, not some specific test, but across all tests. Absolutely right. And people get hung up on this uh, because they say, well, what about the ability to do X? Isn't that independent? And they said, I know somebody who's very good at this, but not so good at this, this other thing. Yeah. And so there are a lot of examples like that, but it's a general tendency. So exceptions really don't disprove you know, your your everyday experience is not the same as what the data actually show. And your everyday experience, when you say, oh, I know someone who's good at X, but not so good at Y, that doesn't contradict the statement of about a, he's not so good, but he's not the opposite. He's not, a ne it's not a negative correlation. Okay. So we're not, our anecdotal data, I know a guy who's really good at, solving some kind of visual thing that's not s sufficient for us to understand actually the depths of that person's intelligence so how this idea of g factor um how much evidence is there how strong you know given across the decades that this idea has been around how much has it been held up that there is a universal uh sort of horsepower of intelligence that's underneath all of it. All the different tests we do to try to get to this thing uh, in, in the depths of the human mind, that's a, that's a universal stable measure of a person's intelligence. You used a couple of words in there, yeah. stable and... I, I, we have to be precise with words. Well, I was hoping we can get away with being poetic. We can. There's a lot about research in general, not just intelligence research, that is poetic. Science has a phonetic aspect to it. And good scientists are, are very intuitive. They're not just, hey, hey, th these are the, the numbers. You have to kind of step back and see the big picture. When it comes to uh, intelligence research, you asked, how well has this general concept held up? And I think I can say, without fear of being empirically contradicted, mm -hmm that it is the most replicated finding in all of psychology. 
Now, some cynics may say, well, big deal, psychology. We all know there's a replication crisis in psychology, and a lot of this stuff doesn't replicate. That's all true. There is no replication crisis when it comes to studying the, the existence of this general factor. Let me tell you some things about it. It, is, it, it looks like it's universal in, uh, that you find it in all cultures. The way you find it, step back one, one step, the way you find it is to give a battery of mental tests. What battery you choose. Take a battery of any mental tests you want, give it to a large number of diverse people, and you will be able to extract statistically the, common, the commonality among all those tests. It's done by a technique called factor analysis. You, people uh, think that's, that this may be a statistical artifact of some kind. It is not a statistical artifact. What is factor analysis? Factor analysis is a way of looking at a big set of data that, and look at the correlation among the, the different test scores and then find empirically the clusters of scores that go together. And there are different factors. So if you have a bunch of mental tests, there may be a verbal factor, there may be a numerical factor, there may be a visual spatial factor, but those factors have variants in common with each other. And that is the common, uh, that's what's common among all the tests and that's what gets labeled the G factor. So if you give a diverse battery of mental tests and you extract a G factor from it, that factor usually accounts for around half of the variance. It's the single biggest factor, but it's not the only factor. But it is the most reliable, it is the most stable, and it seems uh, to be very much influenced by genetics. It's very hard to change the G factor with training or uh, 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 drugs or anything else. We don't know how to increase the G factor. Okay, you said a lot of really interesting things there. So uh, first, I mean, j just to get people used to it in case they're not familiar with this idea, G factor is what we mean. So often there's a uh, this term used, IQ, which is the way I, IQ is used, they really mean G factor in regular conversation. Uh, the way, because we what we mean by IQ, we mean intelligence, and what we mean by intelligence, we mean general intelligence, and general intelligence in the human mind from a psychology, from a serious, rigorous scientific perspective actually means G-factor. So G-factor equals intelligence, just in this conversation to define terms. Okay, so so there's this stable thing called G-factor. You said, now, factor, you said factor many times, means a measure that's a, potentially could be reduced to a single number across the different factors you mentioned. And uh, what you said, it, it accounts for half, half-ish. Uh, accounts for half-ish of what? Of variance across the different set of tests. So if you if you do for some reason well on some set of tests, what does that mean? So that, that means there's some unique capabilities outside of the G factor that might account for that. And what are those? What else is there besides the raw horsepower, the engine inside your mind that generates intelligence? There are test-taking skills. There are specific abilities. Someone might be particularly good uh, at uh, mathematical things, mathematical concepts, even simple arithmetic. People are, some people are much better than others. You might know people who can memorize, oh, and, and short-term memory is another uh, uh, component of, of this. Uh, short-term memory is one of the cognitive processes that's most highly correlated with the G factor. Uh, so, uh, so all those things like memory, uh, taste, t test taking skills account for variability across the the test performances. But you, so you can, you can run, but you can't hide from the thing that God gave you, the genetics. Um, so that G factor, science says that G factor is there. Each one of us have. 
Each one of us has a, a G factor. Oh, boy. Some have more than others. I'm getting uncomfortable already. Well, IQ is a score. And IQ, an IQ score is a very good estimate of the G factor. You can't measure G directly. There's no direct measure. You estimate it from these statistical techniques. But an IQ score is a good estimate. Why? Because a standard IQ test is a battery of different mental abilities. You combine it into one score, and that score is highly correlated with the G factor, even if you get better scores on some subtests than others. Because again, it's what's common to all these mental abilities. So a, a good IQ test, and I'll ask you about that, but a good IQ test tries to compress down that battery of tests, like tries to get a nice battery, the nice selection of variable tests into one test. And so in that way, it, it sneaks up to this G factor. And that's another interesting thing about G factor. Now you give, first of all, you have a, a great book on the neuroscience of intelligence. You have a great course, which is when I first learned you're a great teacher, let me just say. Thank you. Uh, you, you. Your course at the teaching company, I hope I'm saying that correctly. The, the Intelligent Brain. The Intelligent Brain uh, is when I first heard about this G factor, this mysterious thing that lurks in the darkness that we cannot quite shine a light on, we're trying to sneak up on. Uh, so the fact that there's this measure, stable measure of intelligence, we can't measure directly but we can come up with a battery test or one test that includes a battery of um, variable type of questions that can uh, reliably or attempt to estimate in a stable way that G factor. That's a fascinating idea. So for me as an AI person, it's fascinating. It's fascinating there's something stable like that about the human mind, especially if it's grounded in genetics. It's both fascinating that as a researcher of the human mind and all the human psychological, sociological, ethical questions that start arising, it makes me uncomfortable, but truth can be uncomfortable. You know, I, I get that a lot about being uncomfortable talking about this. Uh, let me go back and just say one more empirical thing. Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter which battery of tests you use. So there are countless tests. You can take any 12 of them at random, extract a G factor, and another 12 at random and extract a G factor. And those G factors will be highly correlated, like over 0.9 with each other. That's very So it is a ubiquitous, it doesn't depend on the content of the test is what I'm trying to say. Yes. It is general among all those tests of mental ability. And tests of mental, you know, mental abilities include things like, geez, uh, playing poker. Your skill at poker is not unrelated to, to G. Your skill at anything that requires reasoning and thinking, anything from spelling, arithmetic, more complex things. Uh, th this concept is ubiquitous. And when you do batteries of tests in different cultures, you get the same thing. So this says something interesting about the human mind, that is a computer is designed to be general. So that means you can, so, so it's, it's, not, it's not easily made specialized. Meaning if you're going to be good at one thing, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, has this quote, he's an ancient warrior, uh, famous for the Book of Five Rings in the martial arts world. And the quote goes, if you know the way broadly, you will see it in everything. Meaning if you do one thing, is going to generalize to everything. And that, that's an interesting thing about the human mind. So that, that's what the G-factor reveals.